Welcome everyone to today's program. I'm Shannon Barnett with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have and will follow up on questions we do not have the opportunity to address. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will, all, you will also receive a follow-up email shortly after the completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions you have at that time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Rick Burnett is the Chief Operating Officer of Complete RX. Rick joined the Complete RX team in 2000, uh, 2011 and leads the day-to-day -day operations de uh, delivering for all Complete RX customers. His 25 plus years in hospital pharmacy management includes experience in a variety of settings from small rural locations to multi-system academic settings. Rick started his career as a pharmacy technician. He spent the majority of his career working for a Fortune 20 company where he held various leadership positions in multiple disciplines, including pharmacy management, consulting, product development, and product management. One of his key achievements was the co-development of patented method for analyzing data to minimize drug costs. Ken Maxick is the Director of Patient Safety and Pharmacy Compliance of CompleteRx. Ken has over 20 years of hospital operations, management consulting, and healthcare executive experience. He has managed a broad spectrum of engagements in the area of general operations improvement, pharmacy compliance, patient safety initiatives, medication management assessment, and hospital benchmarking. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Rick to begin today's presentation. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. And I'd also like to thank our audience for taking the time this afternoon to join us. Um, before we get started, I'd like you to reflect on some of these following scenarios. Uh, imagine for a moment that you have a child that's critically ill. The, um, they have a high fever and your doctor tells you, get them to the emergency room right away. So off you go to the emergency room where the attending physician writes for an antibiotic, and then you wait for almost 10 hours to get the antibiotic uh, as you're waiting. Or um, imagine that your grandfather needs to go to the hospital because his diabetes is out of control. So he goes to the hospital, is stabilized, and then started on a new drug and discharge. But then grandpa goes home and then starts to feel bad again uh, and starts complaining about heart palpitations, his legs feeling heavy and they're starting to swell and he's got no energy and can't walk more than a few feet. So things continue to get worse. You take him back to the hospital three weeks later and they do a bunch of tests and on the surface it looks like heart failure, but later on was determined that it was a side effect of a new drug that he was started on in the hospital. Um, a side effect he was never told about when he was discharged and which didn't get picked up when he was readmitted back to the hospital during his admission history. Or um, imagine that your doctor tells you that you have just been diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer. Uh, she tells you to make arrangements to start chemo right away. You set up your appointment. You go to the cancer center to start your treatment. And then you're told that the drug you need is on back order and that you'll need to come back in a few days. Um, now, can you imagine how these patients must have felt um, or their families? Or if you're a hospital administrator, can you imagine how you'd feel about hearing these stories at your team meetings? Um, I, I can because every one of those scenarios that I just provided was something that comes from actual experience. Um, so during our time together, I'm going to try and help you better understand how pharmacy can play a larger role to improve the patient care experience at your hospital. First, uh, we're going to make the case that the current view many hospitals have of their pharmacy department is still too narrow and needs to change in order for you to succeed in today's value-driven market. Uh, next, my colleague Ken Maxick is going to provide some insights on how medication safety plays a significant role in the patient experience and provide some pointers on how to improve programs at your places. Uh, third, we're going to discuss the data around medication safety programs and the impact on patient experience results. And then finally, we're going to talk about the impact of proposed CMS changes uh, regarding medication safety in some other areas. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to run a brief poll to better understand who has administrative oversight for pharmacy services at your facility. 
So if you could, please take a few seconds to answer the following poll question, uh, and then we'll go ahead and tab it up and share the results with you. So the question here is, which best describes who Pharmacy reports to at your facility? Is it A, the Chief Operating Officer, uh, B, uh, the Chief Nursing Officer, C, the VP of Ancillary or Clinical Services, uh, D, a other hospital executive, or E, this doesn't apply to me? So we'll give that a few seconds. And can we share the results? Okay, so it looks like from our polling, it's a, uh, you know, number one is other hospital executive at 22%, VP of clinical services at 19, uh, the COO at 17%, 13% the CNO and 29% doesn't apply. Well, thank you for uh, your participation. So to get things started, um, let's just talk about where the healthcare delivery system is today. As you know, healthcare is in the midst of a big paradigm shift. Uh, under the old paradigm, hospitals focus primarily on treating sickness with most care being delivered in an inpatient setting with reimbursement provided based on a fee per service model. Now currently, the emphasis is on looking at the total health of the patient with heavy emphasis on patient education and wellness as a means to try and keep patients well and out of the hospital. Uh, quality of care is also, also emphasized and those that deliver on quality are gonna be rewarded through higher payments via value-based purchasing. Uh, so the question is, what does all this have to do with pharmacy? Well, for many organizations, the primary review of pharmacy is focused on supply chain. Orders come down to the pharmacy and the medications are dispensed, but I'd like to challenge that thought process for a moment. Uh, for most of you that are pharmacists in here, you'll recognize this as the medication use cycle. And pharmacy uh, is a, really has a big part in the medication use cycle. Of course, the key role of pharmacy is to dispense drugs. And to run the pharmacy itself, you need to work with HR to hire people, finance to, uh, to pay for the drugs and buy the drugs and pay payroll, ID to make the computer systems work, uh, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, then the drug has to go out to the patient care areas, which means you need to have in place multiple supply chain delivery systems to get new drugs up when they're needed and take the old drugs back for processing. Uh, most in the audience are familiar with this process, but in addition to the above, you also need to make sure that smart pump dictionaries are up to date now, that PAR levels are set properly uh, in your dispensing cabinets, and that the drug information in the barcode database can be read by the barcode reader, and pharmacy is also involved with that. And then once the patient gets the drug, the patient needs to be monitored, so that means managing pharmacokinetic dosing protocols, working with microbiology to make sure that you have the panels that match your antibiotic formulary, uh, working with nursing to educate them on new drugs and their uh, effects that they have on patients, and then pharmacy also has a role in that. And then you need to conduct medication use evaluations, adverse drug reaction surveillance programs, medication error reporting systems, uh, if something does happen that has an untoward event, you want to try to do a root cause analysis and failure modes effect analysis to make sure you're keeping your patients safe and you're improving your quality. And once again, pharmacy has a part in that. And then all this is going on while you're trying to figure out where you're going to get your drugs, uh, especially when everything seems to be short or on back order, and then making sure everything is stored under proper conditions with the proper level of security, all while trying to stay in budget, and then pharmacy gets to own that too. And in order to know what drugs you're gonna dispense, administer, monitor, and order, the medical staff has to approve the formulary in all the medication protocols. So that means a lot of work on pharmacy's part in regards to researching the different drug products, doing pharmacoeconomic analysis, uh, and looking at reimbursement for drugs. And then once the protocols are all approved, they got to go ahead and put all that into the CPO system. And pharmacy is a part of that. Now, 
for the most part, the patient doesn't see all this. To them, it's invisible until the time they receive their medication. But the process is extremely important when you think about the impact the medication use cycle has on your patient's care. Think about this for a moment. The medication use cycle will touch just about every patient that walks into the hospital. Uh, and I'll say it again, the medication use cycle is gonna touch just about every patient that walks into the hospital. Not everybody's gonna get an x-ray or physical therapy or have a surgical procedure but almost every patient is gonna receive a medication. And in order for the patient to have the best experience from their drug therapy, this process has to be carried out flawlessly with thousands and thousands of transactions occurring each day. And the linchpin that is at the center of this complex cycle is the pharmacy. So as you think about your pharmacy, don't think about it as a room in the basement that fills orders, makes IVs, and does just a few pharmacokinetic consults. Think of pharmacy services as a type of clinical treatment center. Uh, for example, like your drug therapy management service, uh, similar to how you would view interventional cardiology, surgery, or oncology services. Uh, so now I wanna shift gears and walk in the patient's shoes and see how pharmacy can impact their experience. The patient experience actually starts before they even hit the door of your facility. Uh, your hospital's reputation is critical, and patients want to know that they're going to receive safe treatment. Um, a serious medication error that hits the local media can influence whether or not a patient might even come to your facility. Uh, Ken is going to talk about this area in a little bit in more detail, but perhaps, Ken, maybe you could share some recent examples. Yes, we are certainly all familiar with cases that have occurred, and different ones probably stick out in everybody's minds. A couple that I recall are the case of multiple infants in a NICU in Indianapolis that received an excessive dose of heparin in 2006. And then again, in 2007, another case, also involving an excess dose of heparin occurring in Los Angeles with the twins of Dennis Quaid. Both of these cases are very prominent when speaking about medication safety. Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, you know, because of these errors today, many pharmacies now hire medication safety officers uh, to ensure ISMP best practices are in place to minimize the chance for a med error. Um, just kind of as a point of reference, our organization, uh, we actually complete annual med safety assessments to try to identify weaknesses and processes to reduce the uh, risk. And I think Ken's going to talk about some of those tools that he uses later. But unfortunately, you know, even with all the emphasis on medication errors, many hospitals still don't invest in such resources because you can't see an immediate ROI on a pharmacy P&L statement. Uh, instead, they rely on the director of pharmacy to address medication safety concerns the best that they can or are reacting to events. Um, the next step that hits the patient is on admission. So upon admission, a patient history, including med reconciliation, are necessary. Um, I gave you the scenario before where a med was missed on the med reconciliation, which actually caused a prolonged hospital stay if it was done correctly. And in most hospitals, this is being done by nurses, but many hospitals now are deploying pharmacy technicians to complete this function. Uh, now, this approach has several benefits. Uh, first, it tends to be more cost effective because pharmacy technicians are less expensive to employ than nurses, uh, but be, they're also typically able to complete the work more quickly because they're more familiar with the drug names and the dosage forms. Uh, in addition, this model takes the workload off nursing, which frees up nursing time, especially in the ER, uh, which in turn can help speed up throughput, which means a better patient experience because they're not having to wait in the ER. Uh, as far as the patient stay is concerned, they're in a patient state, they want to know they're receiving good care. Uh, for starters, they want to know that when they show up to the hospital, the medications they need are available. This used to sound like a no-brainer a couple years ago, but ongoing drug shortages, especially for uh, certain chemo agents and anesthetic drug, anesthesia drugs have made this a challenge. Uh, as a point of reference, this has gotten so cumbersome as an organization, we have to hire just one full-time FTE to try to track down uh, drug shortages to see where products available and when they're getting off a of back order. 
Uh, I know, too, there's many instances, feedback we get from buyers that they say this can consume up to about 50% of their day just trying to track down medications. Um, also, patients should be treated using evidence-based guidelines, uh, having their dosages adjusted properly based on their weight, age, renal, and hepatic function, and then having the effects of their medications properly monitored. Uh, this is accomplished in many facilities by clinical pharmacists. Uh, you know, study after study has shown that putting a clinical pharmacist in an ICU saves money and improves outcome, yet many hospitals still have limited investments in clinical pharmacy programs or um, don't even count clinical activities and productivity measures. Uh, also with, you know, clinical I think has an expanded role too because pharmacists now can also review protocols to promote compliance with core measurements. And as you know, with value-based purchasing, there's a big incentive to comply with core measures. Uh, patients also want to have their pain to be treated effectively. Uh, many institutions now include pharmacists as part of a ma pain management team to help get relief quicker with fewer side effects. Uh, and then during the discharge process, patients need to be educated on their medications. Many hospitals now are putting a pharmacist uh, to, to help provide the patient education, but they're also putting them on pain management teams. Uh, and doing this uh, indirectly also helps to improve HCAP scores, which means better reimbursement for the hospital. Uh, Post-discharge, after a patient is treated, we want to make sure that they stay healthy and try to avoid a readmission within the first 30 days. So one of the first things is that the patient needs to have access to medications. And in many cases, this means they need to have access to affordable medications. Uh, you know, generic prescription costs are going up at record rates, especially over the past two years. And with continued consolidation of the market, it doesn't look like this is going to level out anytime soon. So many patients are having trouble to paying for their medications. Uh, in lots of places, pharmacies manage patient assistance programs and or 340B contract pharmacies in, or, in an effort to make medications available to the patients that have economic need. Um, many patients are also going to require follow-up monitoring. Uh, pharmacy can provide services such as anticoagulation monitoring in addition to medication therapy reviews to keep patients from being readmitted into the hospital. A big push right now is uh, medication therapy management reviews, whereby patients with complex therapies have their uh, medication regimen reviewed by a pharmacist to try to improve compliance or identify adverse effects from medications or find more cost-effective ways to deliver their treatment. Uh, right now, there's currently bills under consideration on a federal and state level, which would allow pharmacists to bill for these services. Um, I think 32 states right now uh, give that privilege to pharmacists, but there's still some holdups at the federal level. But should that go through, pharmacists would be able to bill under uh, Medicare Part B for those cognitive services which could potentially be a new revenue stream. Um, once again, these programs are all very complex to administer and may not have a direct ROI in the pharmacy P&L, but can provide significant benefit to the patients and total hospital P&L when you look at the impact it has on reimbursement for value-based purchasing and keeping people out of the hospital. Um, and then finally, when the patients go home, they want a clean bill, including the charges for their medications. So this requires pharmacy informatics resources to ensure the pharmacy charge master is clean and appropriate billing units are applied to ensure revenue integrity. But, so as you can see from the above examples, uh, pharmacy can have a key impact on the patient experience. Uh, now we're gonna shift gears and provide some examples of how pharmacy is impacting patient care with regard to patient safety. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ken. Thanks, Rick. So, what is or can be the impact on patient care of not only the pharmacy, but the medication management system in general? And we have come a long way, but must remember we are on a journey. What we're going to review is some background of what brought us to where we are today and some thoughts on moving forward. On November 29, 1999, the Institute of Medicine released a report called To Air is Human. The authors concluded that more people die every year from medical errors than motor vehicle accidents, breast cancer, or AIDS. And when you extrapolate the results from this report and others, the numbers came out between 44,000 and 98,000 deaths due to medical errors. When we review the subcategory of medication errors, 
there are approximately 7,000 deaths annually associated with medication errors, both inside and outside the hospital. In an additional study, it was noted that two out of 100 admissions have an adverse drug event, and this results in a cost to the system of about approximately $2 billion annually. Based upon a more recent report in 2007 by the Institute of Medicine, it stated that medication errors are among the most common medical er errors, harming at least 1.5 million people each year. It has been estimated that drug-related adverse outcomes were noted in nearly 1.9 million inpatient hospital stays, which is 4.7% of all stays, and 838,000 treat and release emergency department visits, which is 0.8 of all visits. So even the $2 billion estimate may be low. As you mentioned previously, we had the cases related to heparin excess doses in 2006 and 2007. And as we've seen when these types of events occur, they usually hit the local paper, and in some cases the national news media picks up the story also. And unfortunately, these types of cases continue to occur in today's healthcare systems. Some more recent cases have involved mix-ups between high alert medications and others relate to errors associated with look-alike, sound-alike medications. And the next area that has been receiving attention, both within the industry and the news media, are events related to sterile compounding. This type of event was highlighted based upon sterility of products coming from the New England Compounding Center and others. It was more than just the New England Compounding Center. This event brought about a regulatory change through the Food and Drug Administration and the creation of 503B compounding facilities. It does make you pause and consider, why is it that as an industry, such a tragic patient event are needed to move us to improve the quality of services provided? And these events also brought about a regulatory change related to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the definition of accepted standards of practice. And what they stated was that hospital policies and procedures for the preparation and administration of all drugs and biologicals must not only comply with all applicable federal and state laws, but also must be consistent with accepted standards of practice based on guidelines or recommendations issued by nationally recognized organizations with expertise in medication preparation and administration. And examples that they had of such organizations included, but this is not the entire list, the National Coordinating Council for Medication Error Reporting and Prevention, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the United States Pharmacopeia, and the Institute for Safe Medication Practices. And what is of interest is these changes occurred not only for acute care hospitals, but were also included in the interpretive guidelines for critical access hospitals. So how do we move the needle and what type of results can we expect? We are all aware of high reliability industries and those that are frequently referenced are the airline and nuclear power industries. But what is a high reliability organization? What type of results can be expected? And what are some of the steps to move in that direction? First, within a high reliability organization, Everyone who works in these organizations, both individually and together, is acutely aware that even small failures in safety, protocols, or processes can lead to a catastrophic adverse outcome. Workers in these organizations are always searching for the smallest indication that the environment or a key safety process has changed in some way that might lead to failure if some action is not taken to solve the problem. Now, there was a study published by the American Society for Quality and the Quality Management Journal, which just came out last month, July 2015. And this study compared 34 U.S. healthcare organizations that received the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award or were eligible for an on-site visit. And this group was compared with 153 geographically closest competitors. The conclusion was that the Baldrige Award recipients matched or exceeded their competitors' measures of healthcare quality and outperformed them in measures of favorable patient experience. When you examine the resulting data for 39 me measures, 
that U.S. hospitals publicly report to CMS, hospitals that use the Baldrige Care Performance Excellence in this study had higher means and lower standard deviations. This indicates a measurable positive patient experience than the non-Baldridge hospitals in all 10 measures. We'll cover in a minute what are some ways we can act to move in the right direction. But first, let me ask you a question. How confident are you that your medication error reporting system is capturing all reportable events? And I'll give you just a couple of seconds to answer. Okay, so what we see is the vast majority, 49% are not confident, and 33% are somewhat confident. And I will tell you as we move on to the next slide, um, that if the old adage is true and what gets measured gets done is taken into consideration, then we have to ask ourselves as healthcare workers, how good are we measuring our adverse medication information system? And as was noted by the previous survey, most of us today are utilizing a voluntary reporting system for capturing data, and we are aware of the flaws that are a part of such a system. However, uh, we wanted to know what sort of variance this creates. So what we did is we looked at one facility with a census of around 350, and they were reporting approximately 50 medication events per month. We then went to just one unit, the intensive care unit, and we conducted a prospective review for medication events just on that one unit and we determined that they were actually seeing a error rate on that unit of 0 0.86 errors per patient day. This translated into an error rate of 28 events per day on just the one unit when they had been reporting through their voluntary reporting system 50%. So for those of you that were in the 70% group in our poll that said that you thought you did not have a very robust reporting system. This is sort of uh, goes along with that theory. So this meant that every patient on that unit was involved in a medication error. In another review, we looked at pharmacists as our first line of defense in protecting patients from receiving a medication error. So we asked them to review both electronic and written physician orders. And what they were asked to do was determine the completeness of the order. In this attribute system analysis that was conducted over a two-week time frame, we noted that the pharmacists, which are referred to as the appraiser in the graph, were good at being consistent with themselves in determining the completeness, but were not very consistent between the five pharmacists that we asked. And when we compared the reviewers with what we had predefined as the correct answers, there was a very poor correlation. This brought us to the conclusion that if we wanted to improve the process, we first needed to look at improvements in the front end of the process. Training for individuals would need to be conducted along with a rewrite and review of the policy and procedure to allow for a standardized approach to the definition used in determining if a written order is complete. So while we have great intentions, we still need to do a better job. When looking at a medication event, we want to review all of the areas of the process. And many of you will recognize the diagram that's going to be shown as a SIPOC diagram, starting on the left with the suppliers to the process, which could be the wholesaler or medical staff. Next, we review the system inputs which are the items that need to go through the process in order to turn the inputs into the desired output. The medication management process has been broken down into the six steps that are listed here, going from selection and procurement to monitoring and evaluating the impact of the medication on the patient. 
And by following this process, we will create an output that the customer needs and is willing to pay for, or in our case, it may be a third party uh, paying for it. We can look and determine that one of the first risk mitigation strategies is around the formulary system under selection and procurement. After all, it is more difficult to make a medication error if the medication is not in the formulary, your shelf, or in the computer system. Each of the sub-processes will contain multiple risk mitigation strategies or the availability of multiple risk mitigation strategies. Let's look at a sample based upon high alert medications. I know the slide's difficult to read. However, I just wanted to provide a brief overview of how an organization can set up a risk mitigation strategy tool. Along the first column is placed either the medication name or medication class that your organization has decided will be treated as a high alert medication. Then across the top lines are various strategies that can be used in order to reduce risk at a specific point in the process. For example, selection and procurement all the way through um, measuring and monitoring. And what I found when I use this tool going to various organizations is that they tend to use the same strategy for all medications. For example, if we had a medication event, then we would add a second double check to the process. As we've noted in, in the SIPOC diagram on the other slide, let's take a look at the entire medication management system and determine where we could put mitigation strategies into place. Another mechanism that is available to assist in moving an organization towards high reliability is utilizing current staff members to aid in identifying at-risk behavior. At-risk behavior is when people deviate from accepted process safe standards, and they're usually doing this in order to save time or because they need to conduct a workaround in the process for it to work for them. An example of engaging in an at-risk behavior would be if you're driving a car and sending a text message. Now, we all know that this is a habit that we should not do. However, we also know that we have done this on numerous occasions and have not had any consequences that are negative based on our actions. And this is the issue around uh, risk, at-risk behaviors. There is frequently a separation in time and space between the first time we engaged in this at-risk behavior and the time when an error occurred because of this behavior. So what we did is we put together a simple form for all staff to use, management level, uh, pharmacists, and technicians. And we used this in order to identify when at-risk behavior is occurring in the department. It doesn't take very long and is fashioned after the lean philosophy of Jemba, uh, for those of you who are working in lean organizations. We ask each staff member to spend only about two hours per year observing their workplace and identifying at-risk behaviors in the workplace. This information is then collected in a central repository and then can be reported back either during staff meeting or staff huddles. And by doing this and using a simple form, which is a, a variation of a checklist, we were able to get all staff members involved and of course, if you have a staff of 25 or 30 people, then two times a month, there is somebody standing in the work area and observing the work getting done and identifying when people are engaging in at-risk behavior. As was noted previously, the other area that's being looked at now is sterile compounding. And yes, we could probably do an entire webinar just on safety related to sterile compounding. So. For today, let's look at some high-level areas. First, who do we allow to compound? How have we trained them and identified their competencies? Are they working in an environment that causes them to be compliant with the requirements? At one facility I was at recently, they had a report from the third-party contractor, and this report was neatly placed into the filing cabinet in someone's office. When I asked to look at the report, the room had not passed the environmental testing 
and had listed that there were colony forming units on the report. So remember, uh, review the documentation, documentation that you receive and always work to implement preventive and corrective action as needed. I hope that we can see the impact that medication safety has on the patient experience, but also how moving to a high reliability organization will improve the patient experience and financial impact for your organization. And with this, I will hand it back to Rick. Thanks, Ken. Um, as we wrap up here, uh, I just want to make a few comments about the resources needed that you have to invest in your pharmacy. Um, the skills needed to run a pharmacy are becoming more and more complex. Uh, as an early careerist, the focus of pharmacy management for me was primarily on managing the staff, dispensing the medications, and conducting a few quality improvement activities to satisfy joint commission. Uh, but today, the environment is much, much more complex. Uh, the ability to understand and manage technology continues to increase. Uh, as a point of reference, there's now an actually a subspecialty of pharmacy called pharmacy informatics. Uh, and to stress the point even more, my old alma mater, the University of Illinois, now offers a master's uh, degree in this discipline. So it just shows you how increasingly important technology and pharmacy informatics is going to be moving forward. Uh, regulatory requirements are another area to consider. I serve as the Director of Professional Legal Affairs for the Gulf Coast Society of pharmacist, and I had an opportunity to talk with one of our lobbyists at a recent conference, uh, and per the lobbyists learned that pharmacy now is considered one of the most regulated health professions out of all the health disciplines. And the regulations that affect pharmacy are many, and, they, and they're continuously changing from federal requirements, state laws, uh, USP 797, soon to be 800, 340B, and on and on, not to mention all the compliance standards for accreditation agencies. Uh, in addition, drug therapies are becoming more complex. Uh, biosimilars are now just hitting the market, and pharmacogenomic therapies are not going to be far behind. Uh, when I hear about the complexities of these drugs, um, I, I, I kind of long for the old days when we used to argue which H2 antagonist we were going to put on formulary. Uh, and then finding a director with all these skills is becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, most people in leadership positions at this point either know a little about a lot or a great deal about one area, which means you probably have to find help to try to fill in these gaps. Uh, another thing is that we're, it's increasingly difficult to find people willing to take the leadership role, especially with the current generation of upcoming leaders and a lot of more senior people getting ready to retire. Uh, this is because if you look at survey results, Generation X and Millennials, for the most part, do not want the leader chair opting for jobs that offer a better work-life balance. Um, the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that pharmacy is very complex. And in order to deliver for patients, hospitals need to make the proper investments in the people, technology, and infrastructure to make sure the patient has a safe, positive experience during their treatment, uh, keeping in mind that not all the results are going to impact the pharmacy P&L directly, but will have a big ROI for the hospital. So from our brief time, I hope that, one, uh, you'll make the paradigm shift away from thinking of pharmacy as dispensing drugs and instead view pharmacy as a key player in the patient's treatment. Uh, two, that you have a better understanding of how pharmacy can impact the patient experience. And that three, pharmacy is getting more complex and having the right skill sets and leadership are key to seeing that the pharmacy can have a financial ROI, which extends beyond the pharmacy financial statement. Uh, before I close out, I'd like you to take some time to reflect on the talking points and now just take out a piece of paper and rate your hospital as you feel it relates to the pharmacy's role in the patient's experience and rate it as excellent, average, poor, or perhaps I, I really don't know or haven't thought about it. Uh, and, and for those of you that answered excellent, congratulations. Uh, you know, I just love it when I, I hear good things advocating for my profession. Uh, but if you answered average, poor, or even I haven't thought about it, uh, try to make it a point to talk and have a discussion 
about what can be done to get the most out of your investment in pharmacy resources uh, because it can have a huge impact on your patient experience and your bottom line. And I believe with that, we're going to open it up for questions. Absolutely. Ken, Rick, thank you for a very informative and enjoyable presentation. We will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. As a reminder, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into the control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have, and they'll follow up on questions we do not have the opportunity to address. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, give everyone a chance there to type in any questions, and uh, we'll get started with them in just a moment. All right, so just to get started with a question, uh, we have one of our audience members ask, if you were going to invest in one area of the pharmacy and or its processes, what would it be? Okay, well, uh, this is Rick. I think I can answer that, and I think Ken probably has his opinions too. So um, I, I would say if, if I was going to invest in one area of the pharmacy, uh, or its processes. Right now, I'd probably be looking along the lines of pharmacy informatics. Um, as Ken mentioned before, what gets measured, uh, you know, gets done, and there's a lot of data moving through the systems, and in order to be able to have the business intelligence you need, you have to make sure that that data is working right, but that it's also going through on the billing end. It, it's hard to measure and improve performance if you don't have good information to start with. Um, Ken, what do you think? Well, as as you mentioned, information technology is bringing us a long way, and uh, we have certainly seen many organizations uh, have very positive strides in improving uh, patient safety by moving towards a bedside uh, medication verification system. Now, that certainly comes with a price tag. Um, and the other thing that I, I find is as we're moving to CPOE, and this is something that is fairly inexpensive and all organizations uh, should be able to do, is develop a communication mechanism between the pharmacists and your IT and your medical staff so that as the pharmacists are verifying the medication orders, they have an easy way of noting and documenting what are the things that they are changing in that order. Uh, it, it's amazing to me to see that uh, as I observe uh, different central pharmacies in the order entry process to see the number of corrections that each pharmacist has to make within the CPOE system to make it work. And yet when asked, how does that information get back to the medical staff or ask, how does it get back so we could update the order strings, there's oftentimes not a clear two-way communication system. So I would certainly say in, invest certainly in technology and also invest in your infrastructure so that we can add some basic and simple communication mechanisms to improve patient safety. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. The next audience question we have is, do you think it is necessary to track drugs dispensed with drugs not given? Ken, you want to take that one? To, I was just going to ask you, sure. Um, when you uh, First, I guess the question is, um, if we're talking about a, a system where the drugs are being dispensed um, from the pharmacy and are not located in an automated distribution uh, system um, and then are coming back to the pharmacy in the cart fill. And if that is the case, uh, then yes, we should certainly have uh, mechanisms in place to determine why those medications are coming back. And there, as a matter of fact, in, depending on which state you're asking the question from, it's actually part of Board of Pharmacy requirements in uh, certain states that you do have a quality improvement mechanism to track that very information. Uh, one of the other things that you certainly also should be tracking is when, if you do have an automated distribution system, is what is taken out of the medication distribution system versus what is actually documented as being administered in the patient's medical record, whether that be through bedside med verification, 
through an electronic MAR or through a paper system so that you can match up what was removed versus what is documented as administered. And that's certainly not only a patient uh, safety issue to see that the patients are getting the medications that they are prescribed, but that also does have uh, billing issues related to the Office of Inspector General and uh, dropping bills for the patients. Got it. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how receptive are physicians to an increased role of pharmacists in the patient's care? Rick, do you want to maybe uh, start with that? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say just based off of what I see in day-to-day, -day, it's, uh, it, it's still sort of a mixed bag. Uh, increasingly, you, you see more and more pharmacist involvement uh, in getting into a bunch of new areas, too, in regards to med reconciliation and medication therapy management. But there's a lot of institution, and I think this is primarily driven by pharmacy leadership, where pharmacy has really made the decision to stay in that dispensing role as opposed to trying to advance the practice and be more involved with the team. I, I find that once you educate physicians, and they know that you're there at, to help with the patient's therapy and that you can take some of the workload burden off of them, they're more than receptive. So I would say the trend is more and more towards being receptive, but it's really uh, comes down to the pharmacy leadership, you know, pushing forward the vision on that. Great, Rick, thanks. Just a reminder again, if you uh, have questions, make sure you type them into the panel. Um, and hit send, and uh, we'll see if we can get, get them uh, uh, for you. The next question we have is, how do you monitor medication errors, uh, errors I'm sorry, in critical areas such as the ER, the ICU, and the CCU? Well, th there's a couple of ways we could do about that. And, you know, it all starts with the voluntary reporting system that we have in place. Um, and there's then on top of that, you could add various other mechanisms such as prospective review. Uh, as Rick mentioned, some of our facilities uh, do have uh, pharmacists or pharmacy technicians conducting a medication reconciliation within uh, the emergency room. Uh, in other areas, uh, I've actually seen for certain classes of medications, a, a nurse supervisor or a nurse manager will go and follow up on certain patient populations uh, to determine uh, the effect of the medication on the patient. So they're really doing a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with that medication review to see how it worked out. So those are just a couple of mechanisms in terms of adverse drug reactions. There are many hospitals that are currently using uh, trigger drugs to uh, identify when a possible adverse drug reaction uh, has occurred also. Great. Thank you, Ken. Uh, this is a great question. I'd love for both of you to answer, if you wouldn't mind. Um, Rick, if you want to start, the question is, in pharmacy, what would be one area that we can focus on to improve the patient experience? Um, well, I can tell you what's been very popular in the rollout that we have, and it's been focusing on patient education. Uh, there's a lot of patients. Uh, it's kind of interesting that the medications go up to the patient floors, but many patients don't re even realize that there's pharmacists working in the hospital. And having that direct contact with the pharmacist to be able to educate them on the medications. Um, and then that typically also leads to additional questions that they have. Uh, the, the patients seem to like the interaction. Uh, and I think too, by putting a patient uh, in front of a pharmacist, it's more uh, memorable for them because they remember that they talk to the pharmacist and it also helps with the HCAP scores on, uh, you know, did somebody talk to you about the, uh, your medications? Mm -hmm. Great, Rick. And, Ken, do you want to? Well, I, uh, that's actually from what Rick was saying, that, that was my first choice. Uh, but <laughs> I, I will tell you, um, I do, I, it is very happy for me to see more and more pharmacists these days uh, getting involved in antimicrobial stewardship programs and really working closely uh, with the medical staff and, and lab on uh, seeing and working to make sure that the, there's appropriate treatment uh, both 
in terms of surgical prophylaxis and ongoing treatment of infection. And there's certainly a movement, and I do anticipate that next year the CMS will actually write it into their conditions of participation that hospitals initiate an antimicrobial stewardship program. Great, thank you guys, both, both uh, excellent answers. The next audience question we have here is, how can pharmacy drive change in an organization given resource constraints since there is so much pressure on controlling costs? That is a very good question because um, it, it seems to happen all the time. Um, I'm a very, very big advocate of um, using formal strategic planning methods to do that. And when you go through that, part of it is, you know, working with administration, understanding, you know, their environmental analysis, what's coming down the pipeline, the SWAT, looking at the vision and the mission, and then putting together goals and objectives of what you'd want a program to achieve along with resources and what was going to be the intended ROI of that program. And if you can get that alignment and people can understand it more in the global context of what it's going to do for the hospital, typically administration, you know, when they prioritize resources, if they have that better understanding how it fits into the big picture and what the benefit is going to be, the, the probability of you getting that resource is going to go up. Um, I, I have an example where uh, we had pharmacy uh, an institution was very much struggling with some of their HCAP scores, um, so pharmacy stepped up to the plate and said we can really help with pain management and patient education, uh, sold the pro program to administration, got a little bit of extra support, and because that was a local goal and a corporate goal, those resources were approved. Uh, but everybody understood in the organization, too, as regards to productivity measures, even though they were looking at orders filled, that this was a program above and beyond that, so that took off the pressure. But it all kind of started with understanding the strategic goals and objectives of the organization. That would be my suggestion. And I, I would go and look at what your current work processes are. Uh, I mentioned before uh, the number of uh, corrections that pharmacists are making within the CPOE system. Uh, if you're using uh, automated distribution systems. You could look at where you have your current PAR levels and where you have your current min-max levels set up uh, so that you could decrease uh, the number of uh, stockouts and the amount of uh, movement that has to occur with medications there. Um, so we could look at different pieces of what is really adding value um, to our patients in our process. And usually when you map things out, you're, you're able to find you know, probably 10, maybe even sometimes 20% of time uh, that you didn't know existed because you were so busy doing rework within the system. So if you, you take a good look and find the overall uh, value stream within the organization and what you're doing in the med management system, you could oftentimes free up some additional time uh, to start to work on some other projects. Another uh, great audience question here, would it be appropriate to have a business manager managing the pharmacy in order to identify new opportunities and manage non-clinical aspects, thereby freeing up a pharmacist director? Um, yep. This Rick, I, I'll take that question. <laughs> I think in regards to a question like that, there's a lot of uh, it depends questions. Uh, some of it is going to depend on the complexity of the system, the, the census uh, that you have. Uh, I would certainly think, though, whenever you look at any type of operations, you always want to try to le um, leverage the resource that has the lowest skill set. So if you uh, have work that a pharmacist doesn't have to do, that a technician can do, you want to leverage it down to a technician. If you have uh, business functions that a technician doesn't have to do that someone more like an analyst can do, you want to leverage it down to that skill set. If there's some way that you can automate the, the business function, you want to automate the business function. So 
So, uh, like I said, I think a lot of that would just depend on, on the system and what you're trying to achieve and the resources that you have available and kind of doing a, a, a resource review in regards to who's doing what and is that the right person and skill set to be doing the job function. Mm -hmm. Interesting, absolutely. Great, the next question we have is, what's the opportunity for developing great leaders versus finding leaders? Ken, do you want to maybe take a stab at that first? Well, uh, certainly, uh, you know, there's a very small percentage of us that were born great leaders. Uh, the vast majority of us uh, learned uh, through having good mentors and also through having an organization uh, that provided you with ongoing leadership opportunities and helped you to develop uh, as time went along. So you might have gone through from being a staff pharmacist to uh, being an assistant director, then to a director of pharmacy, and then some of you may at this point already have gone to the level of being an enterprise director of pharmacy. So it, it is certainly a developmental process that happens over time. Um, and each one is a separate and additional building block in the process. Got it, absolutely. Rick, do you have an opinion on the matter? Um, I kind of concur with, you know, Ken's observations on there. You know, uh, like I said, a, a key challenge that we, we see today is this finding people that have the desire to be in that leadership role that want to take on the responsibility uh, but I would think a lot of the, uh, you know, attributes you can um, train on a lot of managerial attributes, but I think, you know, leadership requires vision and kind of that person that's willing to take uh, calculated risks uh, moving forward and, and thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I think that is an excellent place to stop, and I think that's uh, perfect considering we are running out of time here. So I want to thank, again, uh, our pre uh, presenters for their excellent presentation and for all of you for participating today. Uh, we really look forward to having you join us for future webinars and um, coming back and joining us for, for more. This concludes today's program. Everyone, please have a wonderful afternoon.